Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all. For those of you who I don't know, my name is William Carter, and I'm the Dean of the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to this year's Mark A. Nordenberg Lecture in Law, Medicine, and Psychiatry. And my job here is quite simple. Um, first, to simply welcome you and tell you just a little bit about the Nordenberg Lecture Series, and then to introduce my colleague, Mary Crossley, who's responsible uh, for today's distinguished speaker. The Nordenberg Lecture began many years ago as the result of a gift from the late Dr. Thomas Detry, former Senior Vice Chancellor for the Health Sciences. The lecture was established in honor of Chancellor Emeritus Mark Nordenberg, and that initial gift has been augmented over the years by gifts from BNY Mellon, Buchanan Ingersoll and Rooney, the late Edwin Klett, Mark and Nikki Nordenberg themselves, and Dr. Lauren and Ellen Roth. We're very pleased to be associated with this interdisciplinary lecture. Um, all of our speakers have been fabulous and really bring unique perspectives to important and timely topics. Um, in that vein, I'm looking forward to today's lecture by Dr. Shepard, um, wait, not doctor, excuse me, Professor Shepard. I just promoted you to a doctorate, so take it while you can. <laughs> so. Um, but I really think both the topic as well as the perspective that you bring will be a benefit to us all. So again, welcome and thanks for coming. Um, the second part of my job here is to introduce Professor Mary Crosley, who will then introduce today's distinguished speaker. Mary Crosley is the John E. Murray Faculty Scholar and Professor of Law at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. Her scholarship focuses on issues of inequality in the financing and delivery of healthcare, encompassing a broad range of topics from the exploration of potential legal remedies for physician bias in medical treatment to consideration of how assisted reproductive technologies might implicate equality concerns. She has been widely published in journals including the Columbia Law Review and the Notre Dame Law Review, among many others, and her scholarly interests are reflected in her teaching. Uh, she teaches, among many other courses, a seminar in healthcare and civil rights, and has also taught health law, bioethics in the law, family law, and torts. Uh, Mary was my immediate predecessor as dean, um, and I've been delighted to be able to work with her as a faculty colleague for her wisdom in that capacity, um, but also have been tremendously impressed with how she has maintained her uh, very high teaching and scholarly productivity immediately upon transitioning back to the faculty, which is something I hope to emulate myself uh, with my own transition. So Mary, the floor is yours. So I'm delighted today to be able to introduce Lois Shepard. Lois is the Peter A. Wallenborn Jr. and Dolly F. Wallenborn Professor of Biomedical Ethics at the University of Virginia. An expert in the fields of health law and bioethics, Professor Shepard joined the UVA faculty in 2008 with appointments in the School of Medicines, Department of Public Health Sciences, and the School of Law. She's based in the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, where she directs the center's programs on medicine and law. In addition to teaching courses in health law and bioethics to a wide range of students, Professor Shepard serves on the UVA Hospital's Ethic Com Ethics Committee and Organ Donation Committee, as well as on a university institutional review board. Professor Shepard's current scholarly and teaching interests are focused on legal and ethical issues at the end of life, human subjects research, organ procurement, reproduction, disability, professionalism, and normative bioethics generally. She's the co-author of the case book, Bioethics and the Law, now in its third edition, and the author of the book, If That Ever Happens to Me, Making Life and Death Decisions after Terry Schiavo. She regularly publishes in law reviews, medical journals, and bioethics journals. After receiving her law degree from Yale University, where she served as senior editor of the Yale Law Journal, Professor Shepard practiced corporate law for six years in Charlotte, North Carolina. She began her academic career in 1993 at the Florida State University College of Law, where she was the Florida Bar Health Law Section Professor and the Dallenberg Professor of Law. And she and I were colleagues and friends at Florida State University. When we were both teaching at FSU, Lois and I organized a symposium on genes and disability, defining health and the goals of medicine. Since then, she has also organized several other conferences, bringing together leading thinkers, including symposia on patient-centered patient health law and ethics, in 2010, 
and one on the medicalization of poverty just this last weekend. By doing so, Professor Shepard has played an important role in fostering the exchange of ideas and collaborations on some of the most pressing issues in health law and bioethics. I have followed her work with interest and admiration for many years, and it's my great pleasure to be able to have her here at Pitt for a few days so that we can all benefit from her thinking on the topic of women's health and reproductive rights. Please join me in welcoming Lois Shepard. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's great to be back uh, in conversation with Mary. And we were both at Florida State for a number of years. and uh, We keep up with each other, but not as well as we should. Um, and thank you to Dean Carter and Alan Meisel and Beth Ann Pischke all for hosting me and making this a wonderful visit. And thank you for being here, too. Um, I think uh, I'm really enjoying this opportunity to share my ideas here on uh, reproductive rights and their relationship to women in health. This, uh, I was just telling Mary, an opportunity like this to, to give a talk like this makes you think, you know that idea I've had for a few years, it's been germinating and just keeps getting put off. If I say I'm going to come talk about that, I'll have to get it done. So that's what uh, I've been working on. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background because this is a, a, a topic that is often fraught, difficult, um, and I want to be up front that also it's, it's somewhat new territory for me. Um, so I have not been writing in reproductive rights for years and years. Um, I have been teaching bioethics and the law, and of course I've included reproductive rights cases in my classes and in my casebook, rights on... Uh, um, cases on sterilization, contraception, abortion, uh, forced C-sections, drug testing of pregnant women. Um, but I haven't written much on the topic of reproductive rights and especially ab abortion in a scholarly way. I haven't staked out a lot of territory uh, in this realm. And preparing for this talk has forced me to, to ask myself why. And I think there are two reasons which are connected. So this is just a little bit of background before I get into the substance of the talk which is that first it's taken me a long time to figure out what I think about this topic. Um, abortion rights, reproductive rights, and particularly abortion rights, they are tough issues, and I'd be lying if I pretended uh, to a certainty that I don't have. Um, they're tough issues to navigate. Even if one supports robust rights and women's reproductive choices, you know, does that mean there can be no restrictions, right? No limits, no regulations. Um, there are reasonable disagreements in this area, uh, but there are also unreasonable disagreements, um, and th which is likely the second reason uh, why I have found plenty of other subjects to write about in my career. Um, it's a bit intimidating to do so. Um, emotions can be high, uh, passions can be divisive. Uh, it's easy to mischaracterize a person's position, you know, and to assume a hostility uh, towards a particular group, women or men or religious groups. Um, so, like I said, it, there, are, there are reasonable disagreements and unreasonable disagreements and emotions can run high. So why jump in now? Um, none of that has changed. Um, I'm still uncertain about many things. Um, and the environment for abortion rights discussion is still pretty hostile. Uh, but I'd say that today it goes beyond that, um, and that right now I think that there's um, an outright public hostility toward women and uh, a significant platform um, for people who appear to hold women to, um, uh, in low regard uh, and see their roles in society as limited, um, either to being sexual objects or reproductive conduits um, or mothers. Um, and so I think now, exactly now, uh, I need to start talking about this subject, and so do a lot of other scholars uh, to, uh, in the mainstream. I think we have relied on people who have focused on reproductive rights, or we've relied on um, feminist scholars to, to carry all the water. Uh, so we need to all let this become uh, more of a mainstream conversation. And hopefully that will lead to some reasonable discourse and maybe 
maybe some compromise is possible. You know, a lot of times in the law, we don't actually all agree. We just agree um, to some kind of compromise. So I'm hoping um, to add a little bit of um, my voice uh, to this conversation. Um, I'll tell you, when I really first started getting interested and feeling like, I gotta start talking, uh, maybe you remember this. Okay, so this was in 2012 um, during the uh, um, debate about the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I was asked to, uh, you know, with respect to contraception and whether it had to be covered, right, by religious institutions, by churches, by religiously affiliated institutions. Um, and I was asked to be on a faculty panel at the law school at UVA uh, to discuss the impending Hobby Lobby case. And I was sandwiched between two men who were talking about religious liberties, which is exactly what the case was about, you know. Um, but I found myself trying to, you know, what could a bioethics scholar add? You know, it was a religious liberties case. And so I tried um, to put the case in the context of the thousands, literally thousands, of um, restrictions since the 1990s that have been introduced. Um, many of which have passed, we'll go over those, um, with respect to reproductive rights. Um, and then this exchange happened uh, in the national media around that time, and it really put a face on things. So basically, Rush Limbaugh, um, Sandra Fluke was a Georgetown University law student who uh, testified in Congress about the need for contraception, co insurance coverage for contraception, uh, for health benefits for reason, for women. Um, and uh, Limbaugh attacked her, you know, called her a slut, said, you know, she's having so much sex, and, you know, if it's going to cost $3,000 for her uh, contraception during, uh, you know, law school, you know, why should we be paying for that? You know, that makes us pimps, you know, so very, very disparaging uh, of her. Um, uh, around the same time, in 2012, this um, uh, representative, Todd Aiken of Missouri, I don't know if you remember this, um, was asked about whether or not there should be uh, an exception to allow for abortion in cases of rape. That has been a traditional exception, but it is now, along with all of these many other restrictions, um, that has been um, taken out, uh, you know, in some states of the statutes, an, abor uh, an exception for rape. Um, and you can kind of understand some of the reasoning why, if you think that Life be human life begins at conception, that must be protected. It doesn't really matter how that happened, right? Um, and what he said is, from what I understand from doctors, that's really rare for women to get pregnant from rape. Um, if it's a legitimate rape, the female body has ways to try to shut that whole thing down. Okay, so this was not only hugely ignorant, um, it, it also, you know, this whole idea like some rape is legitimate and some's not, you know, it, it questioned women's reporting of rape. So, you know, so that's what was going on. And then most recently, you know, I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia, and this is the famous photo now of the um, car attack at the Unite the Right rally, uh, uh, which, you know, the uh, white supremacists and neo-Nazis. Um, uh, we're marching. I'm sure you have read a lot about it and heard a lot about it. And um, and Heather Heyer was the woman who died in this attack. And this is what um, the website, the Daily Stormer, which has been taken off of the, it was on like, um, it was sponsored, not sponsored, but it had its internet address or whatever through uh, GoDaddy, and then it switched to Google, and I don't know if it's found a new place or not, so it, there has been a condemnation of this site, but the, um, the, this was what the Daily Stormer said, and so this is, this is some of the rhetoric that is happening now um, with respect to um, certain alt-right groups um, about women's roles, right? Um, is that really no great loss that she had died because she was childless, so she wasn't filling her, fulfilling her role of reproduction, plus the fact that she was childless, you know, she must have, you know, had a bunch of abortions and, uh, you know, was a horrible person. And then they threw in that they thought she was fat. You know, let's just throw that into, right? So just, you know, what's going on, I think, is a, um, it, we have to understand the restrictions on reproductive rights in this broader way 
um, about a discussion that I would not, I guess when I graduated from law school in 1987, did not think we would have to be having, right? About, we could still debate, you know, abortion, right? And, but do we have to, did we have to have this context of, of this debate or this kind of vilification of women who are childless or this understanding of women as having a certain role? Um, this is a, a little photo from the uh, March um, for Life in Washington, D.C. This is kind of a little, little snarky uh, um, a thing that was uh, on the internet. Uh, see if you can figure out what these people who don't need Planned Parenthood have in common, right? Um, so it's pretty obvious, right? We don't have to. Let's just all look at it together like it's one of those magic eye puzzles and try to unlock the secret, right? Okay, so that's funny, right? But this is less funny, right? So this is the picture of um, congressmen, um, and they were congressmen, so representatives, right, who were debating whether or not maternity care should be an essential health benefit. So this, was, this photo got a lot of play. Uh, when the um, efforts were made to repeal um, the Affordable Care Act, and the question was, well, what are the essential health benefits? And the idea was, well, when men don't need maternity benefits, why should that be an essential health benefit? Um, uh, since then, uh, and I'm not saying that I know that Representative Tim Murphy was in that room or not, um, but you may have followed this, you know, he... Um, has co-sponsored now a second federal law relating to abortion. We also, we already have the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act I'm going to talk about in, in a few minutes, but he co-sponsored the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act, uh, which bans abortions after 20 weeks, except to save the life of the mother. Notice it doesn't say the health, except to save the life of the mother, um, or in cases of rape or incest. Um, and, um, and he's the representative who resigned recently after it became uh, public that he had encouraged his mistress, who was pregnant, to have an abortion. Right. Um, and, you know, he replied to her, I get what you say about my March for Life messages. I've never written them. Staff does them. I read them and winced. I told my staff, don't write anymore. Right. But it's this hypocrisy. So... Are, are the representatives who are weighing in on these discussions, well, are they ignorant, like the Aiken, um, or are they, how much are they diving in, right, and really trying to understand this issue? I mean, so I have doubts. So, um, uh, who controls the conversation around, around women's reproductive rights? My student found this, and I thought this was interesting. This never occurred to me. You know, and this is another reason why I think a lot of people need to start weighing in uh, uh, on women's reproductive rights. So um, men um, uh, both uh, disproportionately represent the bylines on, on articles about um, women's reproductive rights and the quotes within those articles. So, you know, that, that, that was interesting. That didn't, didn't occur to me. Um, and then, of course, let's not forget the Supreme Court, which is deciding a lot of these issues, which is primarily male. Now, in 1973, when Roe v. Wade was, um, was um, decided, you know, it was all men. You know, in 1992, we had one woman, Sandra Day O'Connor. Now we have a few more. Um, now, this is not to say that some of these individuals are not extremely well-meaning, Okay. Um, and I w w assume that all of the people on the Supreme Court are extremely well-meaning, and, and most of the representatives, too. But I think the fact that, I'm going to tie this in later, but the fact that men have controlled a lot of this discussion is one of the reasons why the health of women has not been given enough attention and why it, has, it is talked about, the abortion right is talked about in terms of choice. And choice, choice, choice. It's about decisions and about autonomy and not enough or in addition talking about women's health. And that's because for women, the consequences of sex are different, right, than they are for men. And so even if we have the men who are just wonderful, you know, I, I'm married to one. I have two sons. I love men. They're great. Uh, but 
but I think part of the reason why we haven't had enough focus on the health of women is because men have controlled this conversation. Okay, so we need to engage in conversation with them. Okay, so that's kind of by background um, and some of the context for the talk. But here's what I hope to add to the discussion. Um, that for women, reproductive rights are not merely about choice, they're also about health, and in order to adequately recognize that, we need to start talking about a woman's right to health. We need to recognize that a woman's right to health is essential for robust reproductive rights. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into the more uh, weeds of this. Okay, first my, I'm gonna take this assumption, so I'm actually not, after all that prelude, I'm actually not going to debate whether or not we should have a right to abortion. Um, maybe I will on another day, uh, but right now I'm going to use that a, an assumption that women in the United States have a constitutionally protected right to choose to terminate a pregnancy pre-viability. They have a constitutionally protected right to choose to terminate a pregnancy post-viability to preserve their life or health. Okay, those uh, rights were recognized in Roe v. Wade and confirmed in Casey, and we're going to go through those cases. Okay. So Roe v. Wade, 1973 case, set out a trimester framework. Um, and basically the idea was that in the first trimester, you cannot have any regulation of abortion because uh, abortion was safer than pregnancy. Okay. Um, in the second trimester, the state can regulate abortion for, uh, for women's health. And in the third trimester, that's when the state has a compelling interest because the court determined that the right to abortion was a fundamental right, so the state had to have a compelling interest before it intruded, um, and that it would, um, at the third trimester, it could, it, that, that interest was compelling enough that it could prohibit abortion um, in order to protect fetal life, although it had to have an exception for the health um, or life of the pregnant woman, okay? Um, Roe v. Wade was a compromise decision. Okay, it's, uh, you can find a lot of ideological arguments with it and whether it made sense to, to, to the way the trimester was, was framed out, but it was a, it was a compromise, okay. Um, in the Roe v. Wade decision, you have this explanation for the basis for the abortion right, which oddly, if you read the abortion cases, there is not a lot of explanation. That's why I'm saying we need to elevate this health, health um, interest. Um, it's talked about some, but it, 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 the explications for the abortion right are often pretty slim. Um, so we have this from Roe, the detriment that the state would impose upon the pregnant woman by denying the choice altogether is apparent. Um, specific and direct harm medically diagnosable even in early pregnancy may be involved. Maternity or additional offspring may force upon the woman a distressful life and future. Psychological harm may be imminent. Mental and physical health may be taxed by childcare. So there, there's some promising language there, I think, um, uh, tying to a, a, a health interest. One of the problems and one of the cautions, I would say, if we start talking about women's health is that it becomes now for doctors to protect, right? And it becomes too medicalized. Um, so in, in Roe v. Wade, it, the woman's right to an abortion was described um, as a decision for the pregnant woman to make, okay? I mean, not the pregnant woman, the pregnant woman's physician to make, right? Okay, so, um, so that's not the direction I want us to go in, um, and, and I think there are signs, as we'll get to when we get to more recent cases, that that has been most recently a promising avenue for, to protect women's rights, um, but I don't think we should have to go through doctors to do that. Planned Parenthood v. Casey in 1992. Uh, there was concern that the, for those who were advocates of abortion rights that the Supreme Court was going to um, overturn Roe v. Wade. And it didn't. Uh, instead, it affirmed the essential holding of uh, the right to, of a pregnant woman to a pre-viability abortion. But it, but it did some things that set up the conflict we now have. Okay, so first, instead of that trimester framework, that's gone. It's really what can happen pre-viability and what can happen post-viability. And pre-viability, the state can regulate abortion as long as the regulation does not create an undue burden on the woman seeking an abortion. And an undue burden is defined as a substantial obstacle that the state places in her path 
uh, of, of obtaining an abortion. But interestingly and importantly, the state's interest now to weigh against the woman's right to an abortion, they, they, they can start at the very beginning, right? So the state has an interest in promoting fetal life from the very beginning and an interest in promoting protecting women's health. But these now are in the same space, right, from the point of conception. Promoting fetal life and protecting women's health are in the same space, and so they are set up for conflict which we will get. Um, we still have post-viability, a health exception, health and life exception. Okay, so the first assumption is that that is our framework uh, with respect to abortion rights. And, but another assumption that I think um, is underlying my work is that given that women have that right to abortion, we should support policies and practices that allow abortions that are early and safe, and not just early and safe, but the earliest and safest and that show the uh, respect for women's dignity. Um, so I think we need to start replacing the traditional liberal mantra of safe, legal, and rare that's been around for a long time. And you know, I thought that was a pretty good slogan. Um, but uh, it, it's come under some recent criticism, uh, which I think is right. Uh, one, it suggests that reducing abortion should be the goal rather than reducing the circumstances in which abortion is sought. Right? Because for women who do have an unwanted pregnancy, being able to access the abortion for which they have a legal right is a good outcome. Being able to access what they have a legal right to is a good outcome. Uh, so the things we need to do in reducing the circumstances in which abortion is sought, the unwanted pregnancy, you know, we need to think about contraception use, right? access to contraception. We need to think about, um, and Michelle Oberman at this conference, Mary and I were at last week, talked about the costs of motherhood. We need to support motherhood uh, to make it, it imaginable for some pregnant women to continue with their pregnancy. And we need to think about um, empowerment for women or control of their own sexuality. And I think the whole sexual harassment and um, sexual predatorship that we have seen in the uh, exposed in the news recently really talk, speak to the need for that. Um, uh, also, this, this rare language stigmatizes women, uh, which can cause a harm in and of itself. And also, uh, there is evidence that it delays women's uh, seeking, of, who end up with an abortion, but it delays their seeking an abortion so they have a later and riskier abortion. And plus, it is not rare. So 25% of women in the United States will have had an abortion before age 45. So my husband, uh, he was surprised at this, he said, are you sure about that? You need to go read all those papers. Um, and so, so I went, you know, because he said, are you sure they're not just taking the number of abortions and the number of women, you know, because he's thinking, well, some women might have three or four, right? Um, and actually, this is the lifetime incident. So this is about a four, first abortion. Okay, so this is a surprising statistic for a lot of people, and hopefully it, it makes us think about it a little bit differently. Um, here's some more information about U.S. abortion patients. One thing I think we have to think about is the effect especially on poorer women. 75% uh, of abortions are obtained by poor or low-income women, um, and 59% already have a child. So whatever our, you know, some of us have certain conceptions of the kind of women right, the type of woman who seeks an abortion, and a lot of those um, perceptions are incorrect. Most abortions occur in the first eight weeks, overwhelmingly, of pregnancy, when you can still have a medication abortion. Um, why do women have abortions? Often it's because of their responsibilities, their perception of their responsibilities to others, you know, uh, in their family. Okay, let's get to the uh, restrictions that have taken place. There are over 1,000 abortion restrictions since 1973. These are the past ones. These are not the ones that are just proposed. Over 300 since 2010. Um, uh, I don't know if you, I hope you can read this. Some that I'll just point out are, uh, well, the counseling, mandated counseling, often a waiting period, um, non-medically indicated ultrasound. We're gonna talk about one of those cases. Um, banning Medicaid funding, um, restricting abortion coverage uh, in private health plans. Um, uh, some states require 
um, if you're doing medication abortion, to, for the physicians to follow the rules the, the, the way it was approved in the, by the FDA instead of using the drugs the way that now we know are safer. Um, and off-label prescribing is actually the standard of care in many instances. So there's nothing unusual about doctors prescribing something differently than the way that the drugs were approved for um, um, because, you know, we learn new things, right? Um, uh, requiring, um, you know, the trap laws we'll talk about in just a second, requiring cremation or burial of fetal remains, uh, banning abortions for specific circumstances. This is one of the new strategies saying you can't uh, abort because of gender or because of disability. Um, uh, uh, requiring uh, the different levels of involvement of parents in a minor's abortion. Reporting requirements, you know, like for doctors to submit the ultrasounds to a state authority so they can see what, what the evidence was about when the abortion took place. Um, banning so-called partial birth abortions. Um, most recently, banning the most common method of abortion, which is the uh, D&E, um, and requiring a different kind of procedure. Um, banning abortion after 20 weeks. We saw an example of the federal bill proposed for that and lacking a health exception. Okay, so those are some. There are lots of tar trap laws or targeted regulation of abortion providers. Those are laws that are singling out like abortion clinics for certain regulatory um, things, which sound like they would be in, in the health of the patients, like um, being able to have wider hallways, you know, like if you had to move a stretcher around, or uh, so construction requirements, or the requirement for admitting privileges at a local hospital. You know, that seems a, like a reasonable thing. A lot of times doctors can't get those admitting privileges, however, because there aren't enough, abortion is quite safe, and there are not enough circumstances in which they would need to admit a patient, and if you don't admit a patient, patient's enough, then you can't get admitting privileges. Um, so th they, they have been given this term, tar in a critical way, targeted regulation of abortion providers. Um, so how do restrictions such as these harm women's health? Um, they delay abortion. They cause abortions to be performed by a less sa safe technique. Uh, they restrict access due to scarcity of providers and expense. Uh, seven states have only one abortion provider. Um, over 90% of women in the country live uh, in a county in which there are no clinics or providers. Um, they cause women psychological harm. They can interfere with miscarriage management because doctors are afraid that what they're doing, if a woman is miscarrying but the fetus is still alive but not savable, right? Uh, they are worried uh, that it, they will be seen as doing a partial birth abortion um, uh, and be in violation of the law, but they're worried about the other people thinking that they're doing something that is illegal. So it can lead to, and of course, certain, um, certain you know, Catholic providers, we have a lot of Catholic institutions in, in healthcare, um, might also be a part of this delay, right? Because you can't get the kind of services there. Uh, people are afraid that they're going to be crossing a line, right, into abortion, uh, even though there's the, the fetus is not viable. Um, and then can require a woman to carry to term a pregnancy that risks her health or life. Um, and also we're seeing much, uh, and then concern, uh, concern about self-induced abortion, right? Or uh, people who are seeking an abortion outside of your, you know, regulated and, um, you know, medically appropriate providers, right? And Ginsburg brings that concern up a lot. Okay, so why has women's health been overlooked? I think part of it is because men's reproductive rights don't as obviously affect their health, you know? So when you're talking about the Supreme Court contraception cases, you know, and, and they were the forerunner to the abortion cases, you know, it, it was really about choice. I mean, for men, mostly it's about, do I want a biologically related child out in the world there? You know, there aren't those same health consequences for men uh, with respect to the right to reproduce, the right not to reproduce. And men have been, you know, the ones who have done, been doing a lot of the deciding. So, uh, you know, and, and, and we want rights to be equal, right? So if you're just thinking of, you know, so that's a good thing, right? Men and women have the same rights. Um, and 
so I think that has contributed to this choice language, though, to the exclusion of health. Um, and then I think the second reason why it's been overlooked is that the Supreme Co Court put women's health on the other side of women's rights. So remember when we had uh, the Casey decision, um, now we've got the woman's right to an abortion, but the state can regulate for her health and intrude upon that right to preserve her health. So they're, you know, right, women aren't raising their own right to health, the state is protecting women's right to health. Um, so I'm going to talk about three cases. So my, the little poster for this talked about the, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the woefully inadequate. I'm going to talk about a couple of recent cases. So the first, the bad and the ugly, I think, is Gonzales v. Carhart. This was a 2007 decision in which the Supreme Court upheld the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act. Um, of course, in medicine, they don't call it a partial birth abortion. Um, it's the intact DNA, and e um, and, this, and the federal government passed a law that prohibited this procedure and did not include a health exception. Okay, so from Roe and Casey, we've had a health exception all along, and in fact, uh, seven years earlier, the Supreme Court had invalidated a Nebraska statute that was very similar but different also, um, uh, uh, saying that it was unconstitutional because it lacked a health exception. Okay, it was unconstitutional for other reasons too, but in Stenberg v. Carhart, that's why this is called Carhart too, the Supreme Court had said, no, that, you can't have that because you don't have an exception for the health of the pregnant woman. Um, so in, in this decision, uh, they permitted the, a total ban on this abortion procedure without a health, health except, exception. Now, this, the, the important thing to note about this is women could still have an abortion, these are pre the pre-viability abortions, right, could still have an abortion with a different procedure. So the state's interest here was not strong in saving fetal life. It, so women were not prohibited from having these pre-viability abortions, they could still have them, but had to use a potentially uh, less safe method, okay? So now you've got the interest in indirectly protecting fetal life, right? Not this fetal life, right? Indirectly protecting it um, in, in by, you know, preserving, um, uh, the idea was that maybe some women would be, uh, choose not to have an abortion if this method was not available, right? But, but very indirect, because it was still available to them as a right. Uh, uh, it, it also only considered whether or not the, the impact of this restri restriction had an effect upon a large number of women. Ginsburg really took the court to task for this in dissent, saying, well, it, it only matters for those for whom it is relevant, right? Yes, it is a very rare procedure. For some women, it will be the safest procedure. The fact that it is not a procedure that is needed by a vast number of women doesn't matter. We have to think about how it affects the women for whom it is of concern. Um, uh, so, and it also gave the state a lot of, uh, the states a lot of deference, or the government a lot of deference with respect to what it thought were medical risks. Okay, the ugly part of it, I think, so that's the bad part. I think the ugly part of it is that endorsed protection from decisional regret and a female vulnerable emotional state as a permissible, permissible rationale for prohibiting the procedure. So Justice Kennedy, in his opinion, talks about, well, you know, there's no data, but uh, it seems unexceptional to conclude that women would feel regret if they learned about what had happened in this procedure after they've had it done. Of course, Ginsburg's response is, okay, we'll provide them the information, right, ahead of time. If you're worried that they're going to have regret, don't ban the procedure, provide them the information. Um, and she also says that eliminating or reducing women's reproductive choices is manifestly not a means of protecting them. So the court was setting up concern about women's psychological health against their physical health, right? But what's the mechanism for women to raise their physical health, right? Because it's all about the right to choose. It's not about the right to protect your own health. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip this and go on to the, uh, this is how I see visually um, what Gonzales v. Carhartt did. 
um, the women's liberty interest, we have the right to choose to obtain an abortion. And by the way, from Casey, Casey it's not a fundamental right anymore, it's a liberty interest with this intermediate kind of scrutiny of undue burden. But on the woman's right uh, side, you have the right to choose to obtain an abortion. And on the state's interest, you have, right, they're all piling up, right? It's no longer just fetal life. And in fact, in Carhartt, I've kind of uh, faded it out because that's not what they were protecting. They weren't actually protecting fetal life. You, women could still have an abortion. Um, they weren't protecting the health of the pregnant women. Instead, they were adding these other interests, women's decisional regret. They were concerned about societal coarsening. Uh, society's views on human life were getting, were, would be coarsened because th this procedure resembled infanticide too much. We need to, you know, worry about that and protecting the medical profession. But it opened, the main thing is it opened the door. What other interests could we stack up here? So on this other side, we can also stack up the interest in uh, protecting people against discrimination, you know. And uh, so, so in other words, so you don't, you can't abort for a, a fetal anomaly, you know, for, because that would be discriminatory against people with um, disabilities. And, you know, I, Mary and I have both, I think, been more on the disability rights advocacy kind of way of thinking about things, concerned about people with disabilities, but this is kind of a, a distortion of that. Um, uh, so you can imagine all of these other, you know, if, if we're worried about the coarsening of society's views of life, you know, that can justify this, well, we've got to bury the fetus, the aborted fetus, right, adding to the expense, and all of those things. You can just, you can imagine the kind of things that you can do, and in fact, you saw, right, the list of all the restrictions that are in place. Okay, the good. Whole woman's health, uh, the decision that uh, struck down um, some of the trap laws in Texas, this is uh, Wendy Davis, when she did that big filibuster, you might remember. And the Supreme Court did strike down the two, two provisions of the uh, Texas bill, um, which required admitting privileges and required surgical center requirements. And what they did, and so they were, they were concerned about uh, this undue burden and decided that an undue burden had been placed in women, uh, women, a substantial obstacle had been placed in women's path because they were making it more and more difficult to access an abortion because clinics were closing because of the aggregate effect of some of these trap laws. So in a way, you know, it's a, it's a good decision because it no longer was going to defer to states for whatever they said, well, we're doing this in women's health interests, we need to do this. It's like, well, look, we're really going to look at it, you know. Does it really w benefit women's health or not? And determine on balance they did not and struck them down. Okay, so that was good. But the problem remains, right? Because the problem there was that they're saying, we're doing these things for women's health, and then the court said, well, not really. No, you're not. On balance, these are worse for women's health than, than benefiting women's health. But it doesn't tell us anything, doesn't advance the jurisprudence on what do we do about weighting women's health interests against all those other interests right, that we talked about, the coarsening of society's views of human life and, um, uh, and uh, the integrity of the medical profession and, you know, fe preservation of fetal life doesn't tell us. So I think we, in order to respect dignity, we need to allow women to start. We need to add on the other side of the scale uh, women's health. A woefully inadequate uh, case is the one in the Fourth Circuit, uh, the N North Carolina ultrasound law. This, it had a real-time display where the physician had to face the monitor towards the pregnant woman for the ultrasound, which was required, and had to uh, explain what he or she saw during the ultrasound. Um, and the statute says that a woman could, you know, can, can cover her ears, you know, and avert her eyes, right? but the, the physician has to continue, even if it's clear that the information is unwanted. So the Fourth Circuit struck that down, which I obviously think was a good decision, but it did so on the, because it violated the physician's First Amendment rights, you know, which is just, and you know, you go with the winning argument, right? So it is what it is. Um, uh, and the, and the, the, the opinion had a little bit of sensitivity to this, the situation of the pregnant woman. So I think this quote is pretty good. 
Um, the provision finds the patient half naked or disrobed on her back on an examination table with an ultrasound probe either on her belly or inserted into her vagina. Informed consent has not generally been thought to require a patient to view images from his or her own body, much less in a setting in which personal judgment may be altered or impaired, yet this provision requires that she do so or avert her eyes. Um, so to me, it fails to recognize women's interests in her own autonomy, bodily integrity, and dignity, right? Um, so what would a right to health look like and where would it come from? So this is the work I still have to do. <laughs> um, uh, would it be a separate right? Should we start thinking about a woman's right to health? And it can be, it can be for men too, right? We'd want it all equal, so we could all have a right to health. It'd be a negative right, of course, I'm not talking about the state has to provide you to anything, but just don't get in the way, right, and as a negative right. Or would we think about it as an interest and, you know, sometimes Supreme Court, I mean, uh, constitutional rights are described as a more specific right, like a right to contraception or abortion or marriage or this or that or the other, um, that are based on a constellation of interests. So the constellation could be the, the decisional autonomy, um, her health, women's health, uh, their interest in equality, a lot's been written about that, um, uh, the importance of reproductive rights to women's equality. Um, so what kind of precedent, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm open to a discussion on that. I haven't figured that out. Um, what kind of precedent what might we have? There's some bad precedent. There are a couple of cases, one Supreme Court case in particular, about access to experimental drugs, and the court was like, there's no right to access experimental drugs. But that doesn't mean we have to extend it beyond what, what, what that case was about. In some places, health has been lurking in the back of a lot of decisions, like the famous vaccination case. You can't require someone to be vaccinated. You can have state mandated vaccines, but you can't require someone to have a vaccine if, it, if it's a health risk to them, um, the Jacobson case. Um, physician assisted suicide, O'Connor wrote about, uh, well, we might look at this differently, whether or not people have a right to physician assisted suicide if they didn't have access to palliative care. You know, so their health is, is, and some people started talking about, well, is there a right to palliative care? The immature minor abortion cases are based on best interests. They're not based on autonomy or choice. You know, so courts have been allowing, allowing immature minors to have abortions on the basis of their objective well-being, right? Um, and, of course, the longstanding health exception, which, you know, went away in Carhartt. Uh, but we don't know. We think it's still there. Um, but didn't get a lot of attention in Carhartt or, or validation. Um, that also, you know, uh, serves as some precedent. Uh, I also think with the Affordable Care Act now in conversation, and I'm curious what the other health law prof professors think about this, is, you know, you hear people talk about a right to health and a right to health care that you didn't. Fifteen years ago, people were not holding up signs, <laughs> you know, that, that there was a right to health or a right to health care. So I think the conversation has changed, too. Uh, so the, there's been a cultural shift that might make it more um, possible to talk about uh, a right to health. Um, here, last picture, this is the Charlottesville Clinic, a mile and a half from my house. Um, and I think um, I'm hoping that we can change some of the dialogue about this. Um, so that we can avoid women having to walk through this um, in order to access, you know, health benefits. Um, other strategies I have uh, to think about for change in addition to this right to health, um, you know, court administrators need to be providing information to minors. There's studies often show that when people call up, you know, courts and ask for information, um, about how to access the judicial bypass, avoiding parental notification or consent, that some courts will just say, oh, well, we don't do that here, right? Um, uh, departments of Health need to provide unbiased and non-stigmatized resource information. Healthcare assistant, we don't, we need to quit cabining this off into abortion clinics, which can be vilified, and you have those protesters. Why isn't this a part of normal care if it's a legal right? Why isn't this a part of normal clinic care and hospital care and part of comprehensive training and medical education? Um, and then finally, I think more scholars who have not, who have, who, who are 
have something to do with this area, but have kind of been careful to say, well, I'm not going to talk about that uh, for years, that we need to start talking about it and maybe having a, a reasonable dialogue, um, e even though we won't agree on everything. So thank you. Um, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the talk, and I was just wondering if you could um, talk a little bit more about the fetal anomaly exception and why you think that, that I mean, I realize that this is being used politically in ways that are unsavory, um, but it does strike me as a little bit concerning, especially since we know that genetic counselors sometimes advocate abortion in the case of um, Down syndrome or conditions that otherwise, you know, it really would be more of a, a choice or, or they could even get some, some, some support in, in raising uh, such a child. So if you could talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Um, well, uh, so I think it's, it is a problem that, and I don't know what the rate is now. At one time it was estimated to be 95% of women who are uh, carrying a child with Down syndrome abort. Um, and I, I share concerns about that. Um, uh, and I think the, but, but to me the solution is not to ban, not to have women to have to explain themselves. You know, that's part of the problem, right? Is certain reasons are good reasons and other reasons are not good reasons. So that's my, my main, you know, problem with that. You know, but I think, uh, just with wanting to reduce the incidence of abortion, which, by the way, have had huge declines in recent years, and we think that's because of access to contraception, um, is that we think about um, reduction. Uh, you know, uh, uh, what can we do if, if our goal is to um, encourage more women to carry those pregnancies to term? I, don't, I think the solution is not to hide information from them so they won't act on it, and I don't think it's to ban them. Uh, from having an abortion and say, well, you could, ab you could abort a healthy, a totally, you know, uh, uh, and that's acting like Down syndrome is not healthy, and so I, I shouldn't have done that. I didn't mean that way. But, you know, a child without Down syndrome, but you're going to abort that. Um, you know, instead of doing that, we need to support um, women through their pregnancy and support these uh, children, make sure they get uh, good information instead of biased information. But the state has had a role in the past in encouraging um, uh, prenatal testing and abortion of uh, fetuses with Down syndrome. So, for example, California has had a law for a long time, unless it's changed, which I don't know about, requiring um, women to sign a form if they were going to reject the test for um, the AFP test, and they do other tests now, but this is a while ago. Uh, which kind of, you know, was signaling to them um, uh, you're doing something really odd if you're going to reject this test, right? The state was kind of putting a little nudge, you should have the test, and then, you know, then the nudge is going to be, you know, that you should terminate the pregnancy. So, the, so it's, I, I agree that it's something we should be concerned about, um, but I don't think the solution is right. The, I, I think that, I think it's just, it's just political too. I, I don't think there's any real concern. Um, so. Well, I thought you really laid it out beautifully. And I, I'm not unfamiliar with the issue, but I understand it better now. But what struck me as I looked around the room is the absence of people like me. And I think Representative Murphy summed up the whole problem, and that is men sort of abandon the issue or, or exclude themselves from the discussion until it immediately impacts them. And you're never going to get a reasonably decent viewing of the problem until they realize that ultimately, just as most of the women in this room will probably never come, have to make that decision, uh, neither will most of the men. But if it's there, you really want to have a decent legal setting from which takes place.
Yeah, I, th I think that's a great point. When I teach this uh, reproductive rights class, um, you know, it's like, you know, 90% women who come to the class. So how can, right, how can we get men involved in the discussion in ways other than as the decision maker, right, right at the time, you know, and when they're feeling politically, um, you know, under scrutiny or, or feeling like they have some political gain or risk, right? Uh, so I think that's a, an excellent point. I'll hang around a few minutes if you want to come.